It's known as Montezuma Castle, a towering five-story ruin carved 90 feet above the Arizona desert, long rumored to be the fortress of an Aztec emperor. The official story trapped this place in myth for over a century, but new findings have finally revealed the hidden engineering and true origins buried within its limestone walls. Built by the Sinagua, people with no link to Montezuma and no written language, the structure defies explanation. How did they raise a cliffside community here, centuries before modern tools, and why did they abandon it just as their greatest achievements took shape? What you think you know about Montezuma Castle is only half the story. The truth changes everything. The name Montezuma Castle is a puzzle in itself, one that reveals more about the imaginations of early explorers than the people who built it. When 19th century settlers first stumbled across the ruins in Camp Verde, Arizona, they saw a five-story cliff dwelling perched high above the creek and, searching for a story, reached for the grandest name they knew. They chose Montezuma, the legendary Aztec emperor, despite the fact that the real Montezuma was born nearly half a century after the last embers of life faded from these rooms. There is not a single thread connecting this place to the Aztec world. The Sinagua, the true builders, had no written language to correct the record, and so the misnomer stuck. Even the word castle is misleading. What rises from the limestone wall is not a fortress, but a carefully planned apartment complex built to shelter families, store food, and host community life. There are no battlements, no royal chambers, no throne rooms, just stacked rooms, small doorways, and the remains of wooden ladders that once linked the floors. The Spanish word Sinagua itself means without water, a name given by later chroniclers to describe the challenge of living in a land shaped by drought and flood. Yet the Sinagua were anything but isolated or desperate. Their settlement here, beginning in the early 1100s, was a feat of adaptation, not accident. The naming error, however, had staying power. It appeared on surveyor maps, in newspaper articles, and in the official designation when President Theodore Roosevelt declared it a national monument in 1906. By then, the myth of an Aztec connection had already woven itself into travelogues and guidebooks, obscuring the real story. For decades, visitors arrived expecting tales of lost empires and hidden kings. Instead, the evidence points to a thriving community of farmers, artisans, and traders, people who built with limestone and clay, lived in close quarters, and left behind clues in every beam and pottery shard. The true wonder of Montezuma Castle lies not in borrowed legend, but in the ingenuity of the Sinagua, who raised a home in the cliff's sheltering arms. Peeling back the layers of myth, the real achievement comes into focus, a structure born of necessity, refined by experience, and perfectly tuned to the rhythms of the Verde Valley. The misplaced name is a relic of outsider fantasy, but the stonework and its story belong to the Sinagua and the land itself. Across the Verde Valley, evidence of the Sinagua's earliest presence lingers in the soil and stone. By the beginning of the 12th century, these people, farmers, builders, traders, had already left their mark on the region, but their story is anything but straightforward. A violent interruption came from the north, the eruption of Sunset Crater, sometime between 1064 and 1085. For years, thick ash blanketed fields and choked the air, driving families to seek safer ground. It was not a permanent exile. Volcanic ash, once settled, transformed the valley's soil into something richer, darker, and far more fertile than before. Around 1125, Sinagua families returned, carrying with them seeds, tools, and the memory of disruption. The new beginning was marked by careful planning and cooperation. Small hamlets and open villages began to cluster along the valley floor, each linked by kinship and trade. The Sinagua were not isolated. They belonged to a wider Puebloan world, exchanging pottery, cotton, and obsidian with neighbors as far as the Hopi Mesas and the Hohokam settlements to the south. Their architecture reflected this network, a blend of local ingenuity and shared tradition. Permanent settlements took shape in the shadow of the cliffs, their walls rising from limestone and clay. Early structures were modest, single rooms or small clusters built close to water and arable land. Over generations, as families grew and the valley's bounty increased, 
these dwellings multiplied. By the late 1200s, the Sinagua had refined their craft, raising multi-room buildings that hugged the rock face and made use of every ledge and alcove. Timber from sycamore trees, cut with stone axes, spanned the gaps. Mud and ash mortars, mixed by hand, bound the walls together. Life in the Verde Valley was shaped by cycles of flood and drought, of planting and harvest, of movement and return. Archaeological layers tell the story, pollen from corn, beans and squash, charred wood from ancient hearths, shards of painted pottery left behind in abandoned rooms. By around 1300, the population reached its height. Montezuma Castle itself, now the valley's most famous landmark, began to rise above Beaver Creek. It was not the work of a single generation, but the result of centuries of adaptation and collaboration. Each new room, each added story, speaks to a people responding to the land's challenges and opportunities. The Sinagua's return after the eruption was not simply a resettlement, it was a transformation. The valley became a patchwork of fields, villages, and cliff dwellings, each one a testament to resilience and shared purpose. This was a community poised for its greatest architectural achievement, ready to carve a home into the sheltering limestone high above the floodplain. High above the floor of the Verde Valley, Montezuma Castle clings to its limestone alcove like a swallow's nest, its design both daring and precise. The structure rises five stories, with rooms stacked one atop another, each shaped by the natural curve of the cliff. Early builders began with the deepest part of the alcove, using the rock face itself as a rear wall. From there, they worked outward, laying thick limestone blocks and binding them with a coarse, caliche-rich clay. The result is a honeycomb of rooms, some as small as 8 by 10 feet, others larger, arranged in a tight, vertical cluster. Estimates of the total number of rooms range from 45 to 60, but at its height, about 20 of these were in regular use, sheltering families and storing the community's food and goods. Each story is supported by the remains of sturdy sycamore beams cut from the creekside below and hauled up the cliff face. These beams jut from the walls in uneven rows, their ends still visible after centuries. Over the beams, smaller branches and reeds formed a lattice, then a thick layer of mud plaster finished the floor above. The ceilings are low, sometimes no higher than five feet, forcing even the shortest adults to stoop. The rooms open into each other by way of small, square doorways, some barely large enough for a person to crawl through. Light and air filter in from the cliff's edge, but in the deeper chambers, both are scarce. Access to the entire complex depended on a simple, yet effective, system, ladders. There are no internal stairways or ramps. Instead, ladders could be raised or lowered between floors making movement possible, but never easy. The only entrance from the ground was another ladder, propped against the lowest ledge and quickly pulled up in times of danger. This arrangement transformed the cliff into a natural barrier, discouraging would-be intruders and offering a sense of security that open ground dwellings could not provide. The small doorways served a double purpose, conserving heat in winter and limiting the spread of smoke from hearth fires. The alcove itself dictated much of the layout, where the limestone jutted or receded, rooms were shaped to fit, sometimes resulting in irregular corners or angled walls. In places where the rock offered no ledge, the Sinagua built out with timber and stone, cantilevering rooms above the drop. Over time, as families grew and needs changed, new rooms were added, sometimes blocking windows or doors from earlier phases. The pattern of construction reveals a living architecture, not a static plan each generation adapting the space to suit its own rhythms. From a distance, the castle's form appears unified, but up close, the patchwork of repairs and modifications becomes clear. Some rooms bear the marks of repeated plastering, while others show the scars of collapsed floors or replaced beams. The ingenuity of the Sinagua lies not just in building high, but in making the most of limited space and materials turning a sheer cliff into a multi-story home that balanced safety, shelter, and community life. Inside Montezuma Castle, daily life unfolded in a rhythm shaped by necessity, skill, and community ties. The rooms, though compact and dim, were alive with the sounds of work and conversation. 
In one corner, a spindle word as a woman twisted cotton fibers into thread, her hands moving with practice speed. Sinagua cotton was not just for warmth, it was a medium for intricate designs, with patterns passed down through generations. Finnish textiles found their way into trade networks that stretched far beyond the Verda Valley. Pottery shards, ground smooth by centuries of handling, tell a story of shared meals and careful storage. Each vessel was shaped from local clay, painted with mineral pigments, and fired in open hearths. Some jars held corn, beans, or squash from the fields below, others stored seeds for the next planting season. The grindstones worn by years of use, the bone awls and shell beads, all speak to a people who valued both utility and beauty. Trade was not a distant concept, but a part of everyday existence. Archaeologists have recovered turquoise from the southwest, seashells from the Gulf of California, and copper bells that likely traveled north from what is now Mexico. These items were not mere curiosities. They were tokens of relationships, carried along routes that linked the Sinagua to distant cultures. Obsidian flakes, traced by geochemical signature, reveal exchanges with the Hohokam, Hopi, and Zuni, and perhaps even farther afield. In return, Sinagua cotton and finely made pottery moved outward, strengthening the bonds of commerce and kinship. The work of building and maintaining the castle itself was never truly finished. Sycamore beams cut with stone axes and hauled up the cliff face needed regular inspection and replacement. Plaster walls required patching after each monsoon season as cracks opened and clay washed away. Every repair was a communal effort drawing on the skills of builders, plasterers, and woodworkers. The marks of these hands remain visible today, layered in successive coats of mud and lime. Rooms served more than one purpose. By day, they were workshops and storerooms. By night, they became sleeping quarters. Communal spaces hosted negotiations, celebrations, and the sharing of news from travelers. The air would have been thick with the scent of roasting corn, the tang of smoke, and the quiet murmur of voices echoing off stone walls. Children played on the balconies, watched over by elders who remembered the valley's older settlements and the eruption that once drove their ancestors away. Just east of the main dwelling, the remains of Castle A hint at an even larger community. In its prime, Castle A likely housed more families than the visible castle today. Excavations in the 1930s unearthed charred beams and a scatter of broken pottery evidence of a sudden and dramatic fire. The artifacts recovered there, tools, ornaments, and fragments of daily life, expand the picture of Sinagua society, suggesting a settlement that thrived on cooperation, adaptability, and far-reaching connections. The prosperity found within these walls did not last forever. The traces of trade, craftsmanship, and communal life now serve as silent witnesses to a time when Montezuma Castle stood at the heart of a vibrant network its people looking both inward to their families and outward to a world of exchange. By the early 1400s, the rooms of Montezuma Castle stood empty. What forced the Sinagua to leave remains uncertain, but drought stands out in the evidence. Tree ring records from the southwest show a sequence of dry years in the late 1300s and early 1400s, enough to wither crops and shrink Beaver Creek to a trickle. Archaeologists have traced pollen grains buried in the soil, corn, beans, squash, gradually giving way to wild plants as farming waned. Some researchers point to resource strain and the arrival of new groups in the valley, while others see signs of conflict in the sudden abandonment of Castle A. No single answer fits all the clues. What is clear is that, after nearly three centuries, the Sinagua walked away, leaving their homes to the wind and sun. The centuries that followed were not kind to the castle's silence. Looters, tourists, and curiosity seekers chipped away at the walls and carried off potsherds and woven fragments. By the late 1800s, damage was so severe that even casual visitors remarked on the loss. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt stepped in, invoking the brand new Antiquities Act to give Montezuma Castle federal protection as one of America's first national monuments. This was more than a legal decree. It was a call to stewardship, echoed in Roosevelt's words about preserving the ingenuity of the ancient inhabitants. Preservation did not end with a signature. In the 1930s, teams from the Civilian Conservation Corps arrived, 
braving the heights to stabilize crumbling masonry and shore up beams. Their hand-drawn plans and careful repairs are still visible in the patchwork of mud and stone. By 1966, the site was added to the National Register of Historic Places, cementing its status as a cultural treasure. Today, about 400,000 people visit each year, following a winding path beneath the cliff. The castle is closed to entry, but the museum and trails remain open daily from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., except on Christmas. Each visitor walks in the shadow of both loss and rescue, a reminder that what survives depends on the choices made by those who come after. Five miles north of the castle, the ground opens into a circular chasm nearly 400 feet across. Montezuma Well is more than a geological curiosity. It is the heart of a living water system, engineered and revered long before the arrival of surveyors and scientists. Water pours from hidden springs at a steady rate, bubbling up through limestone and carrying with it a chemical signature that is both a gift and a warning. The well's water is rich in dissolved carbon dioxide and arsenic, making it undrinkable. Yet the Sinagua saw opportunity where others might see danger. They carved a canal from the well's outflow, guiding water along a gentle slope to irrigate fields that would not survive on rainfall alone. The canal's line, still visible today, traces a path through mesquite and juniper, its banks hardened with stone and the memory of countless hands. The engineering here is as deliberate as anything found in the cliff. By following the natural gradient, the Sinagua ensured a reliable, gravity-fed flow that minimized erosion and waste. Travertine, deposited by the mineral-rich water, required regular clearing, a task woven into the rhythm of planting and harvest. Crops flourished in the well-watered soil, even as the people respected the limits of what the water could provide. Oral traditions, especially among the Yavapai, describe the well as a place of emergence, a sacred portal between worlds. The water was never used for drinking, and stories warn of consequences for those who broke this rule. Modern studies confirm what tradition has long held. The arsenic in Montezuma well is present in every drop, absorbed by plants and, over time, by those who ate them. Yet the Sinagua persisted, adapting their farming and honoring the well's power. The canal system, simple in appearance, complex in design, stands as proof that survival here depended not just on ingenuity, but on a deep understanding of the land's gifts and dangers. The well, the canal, and the stories that surround them form a legacy that endures, flowing quietly beneath the surface of the Verde Valley. Montezuma Castle rises 90 feet above Beaver Creek, with five stories and up to 60 rooms, its stone walls and timber beams still standing centuries after the Sinagua people built them. Archaeological evidence confirms the Sinagua engineered this site between AD 1110 and 1425, using local materials and innovative design to protect against floods and intruders. Trade goods from distant regions show a community deeply connected to a wider world. Yet, even with tree ring data and artifacts, the exact reasons for the Sinagua's departure around 1425, whether drought, resource strain, or conflict, remain uncertain. Since its designation as a national monument in 1906 and restoration efforts starting in 1933, Montezuma Castle has been protected for future generations. Today, the nearby Montezuma Well still flows, its waters and ancient canals reminding us of the region's enduring link between people and environment. What survives here is not only a record of engineering skill, but a testament to centuries of adaptation, community, and stewardship that continues into the present.